Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to talk about graph regularity lemmas. Uh, so Semmery's regularity lemma is a very influential tool. Um, it, it's been quite influential in the development of quasi-randomness by Chung, Graham, and Wilson and the recent development of graph limits. Uh, although it's, so part of this talk will be a, a survey of the various graph regularity lemmas. But I also want to talk about some recent joint works with David Conlin and Yufei Zhao, who just finished his first year at MIT. Uh, and despite the fact that, that the regularity lemma of Samredi is now almost 40 years old, there's still some very basic questions that should be answered. And I'll talk about some recent developments in this area. Uh, so we have to introduce the topic, well, what is regularity? Well, if we have a graph G in vertex subsets X and Y, we can define the edge density, which is the fraction of pairs between X and Y that are edges. And then the pair XY is epsilon regular if for all subsets U of X and all subsets V of Y, uh, with U at least an epsilon fraction of X and V at least an epsilon fraction of Y, this is just saying that U and V take up substantial portions of X and Y, the edge density between u and v and between x and y is at most epsilon, so that the edges are uniformly distributed between x and y in a global sense. What does Semmery's regularity lemma say? Uh, it says that for each epsilon greater than zero, there's a k, which only depends on epsilon, such that every graph has an equitable vertex partition that's a partition into nearly equal parts so these are vertex subsets, such that all but at most an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts are epsilon regular. So almost all pairs are epsilon regular. This is a, a rough structural, structural result for all graphs, and it's one of the, the most powerful tools in graph theory. Um, uh, for example, Samaretti used it in his proof of Samaretti's theorem that the, any dense subset of the integers contains long arithmetic progressions. So one basic question for, for a number of the applications, you'd like to have good quantitative estimates. And uh, so you'd like to understand how fast k grows as a function of epsilon. And it's helpful to introduce the tower function, t of n, which is a, a tower of twos of height n. So t of n is 2 to the 2 to the 2 n times. It's a, it's a big function. And the proof of the regularity lemma naturally gives an upper bound, which is a tower of twos of height on the order of epsilon to the minus five. It's a huge function. And it, rather surprisingly, Gower showed later on that such a tower type function is indeed necessary. Um, in Gower's Fields Medal uh, citation, Bolabash referred to this as a combinatorial tour de force. So what really is going on here in the construction is he's, he's sort of reverse engineering the upper bound proof and showing that it works. Um, so I, I want to first give you the idea of the proof of, the, of Samaritis theorem, Samaritis regularity lemma. So if you're given a partition, P, of the vertex set of a graph, you could define the mean square density. It's an average of the density squared between the par pairs of parts. So because the density squared, the density is between 0 and 1, and the square is between 0 and 1, then an average of them is also between 0 and 1. And it also has another nice property, that if you have a refinement of a partition, then the mean square density can only go up. And this just follows from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So these are two basic properties that the mean square density has. And the main claim for the proof of Semmery's regularity lemma is if you have a partition P into K parts and it's not epsilon regular, then there's a refinement into not too many parts, at most exponential in K, such that the mean square density goes up by an additive constant times epsilon to the fifth. Once you have this claim, you start with a partition, and if it's epsilon regular, you're done. Otherwise, uh, you refine it using this claim, and you keep on doing this until you arrive at an epsilon regular partition. And within big O of epsilon to the minus five iterations, you obtain an epsilon regular partition, and this is because you start off at uh, 
uh, partition, which is whose mean square density is non-negative, and each time it goes up by epsilon to the fifth, and it can never pass one. So therefore, it stops at some point, and you have an epsilon regular partition. Now, how do you prove this claim? Well, if you have a partition which is not epsilon regular, then for an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts, uh, it's not epsilon regular. That pair is not epsilon regular. So you can take a huge subset of one and a huge subset of the other, and the edge density between them differs substantially from the edge density between the, the pair of parts that it comes from. And then you can take the common refinement of all these partitions. So each one you partition based on uh, these subsets, and you take the common refinement. And just like we had this cauchy schwartz inequality, which imp implied that for refinement, the mean square density goes up, uh, there's a cauchy there's a cauchy schwartz defect inequality, which tells you that the mean square density will really go up by a constant times epsilon to the fifth. So that's, that's the rough idea. That's the big picture idea of the proof of the regularity lemma. And if you've worked with it long enough, you get an idea that you really can't improve this much, that the bounds you get out of this are roughly uh, best possible. Um, Samaretti asked already uh, in his original paper on, on the regularity lemma, does the regularity lemma hold when irregular pairs are not allowed? So you'd like it to be true if all pairs were epsilon regular. And there's a number of potential applications which you would get if this was the case. So the, there's some potential applications where you really run into serious issues when you try to deal with the irregular pairs. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. And there's, it was discovered by many people that there's a simple graph that, that gives a counterexample to this. Uh, it's the half graph. It's a bipartite graph with two parts, each with n vertices. And vertex i from the first part is adjacent to vertex j in the second part, if and only if i is at most j. It's a pretty simple graph. And it's a, an exercise that any equitable partition of the half graph into k parts will have a linear and k number of irregular pairs. This was discovered by many people, some of them here. Now, there's at least a linear number of pairs which are irregular. The next step, it's a question of, of Gowers, was to estimate the number of irregular pairs in the regularity lemma. So maybe you could do with just having a linear number of irregular pairs for certain applications. Um, and so Gowers asked this question, and, uh, well, we showed that the answer is really k squared over log star k. So that we give a construction, it's a, a probabilistic construction, which shows, which gives a graph in which every uh, equitable partition into k parts has at least k squared over log star k pairs of parts which are not epsilon regular. Uh, log star is the... Uh, inverse tower function. It's the iterated logarithm function. And this is tight up to the constant factor C. Uh, it also gives a new lower bound for the number of parts in the uh, Samurai's regularity lemma. And the, the construction is really just reverse engineering the upper bound proof. You get this feeling when you're working uh, with the regularity lemma that the upper bound you really can't improve, and you come up with a fairly simple construction, reverse engineering the lower bound, uh, and using randomization wherever possible. And um, the proof that it works is a bit more complicated. Uh, this construction, though, it actually comes from a quite general construction. And it not only applies to this result, but you can get lower bounds for other regularities, other regularity lemmas. So the next thing I want to tell you about is uh, the regularity lemma is a really powerful tool, but it becomes, uh, the real power comes from in using it in combination with uh, the graph counting lemma, which is much simpler, but in other contexts is, becomes much harder to do. So um, let H be a graph on vertices 1 to H. And we have a graph G with vertex subsets x1 to xh, such that each pair xi, xj is epsilon regular with density qij. And you'd like to count the number of copies 
of H and G where the copy of vertex I is in Xi. What the counting lemma tells you is that the count is approximately what you'd expect if the edges were truly random. And you get an error term, which I haven't written here, but there's an error term in which you add to this, which depends on epsilon, uh, which tends to zero when epsilon tends to zero. Now, there, there's two basic proofs of the graph counting lemma. One proof is using inheritance of regularity. Basically, you have these pairs which are epsilon regular, and you try to count embeddings one vertex at a time. So you're going to try to count copies of H by first fixing the first vertex in X1 and counting the number of extensions. And when you pick a vertex in X1 by the epsilon regularity, almost all of the, ver almost all the degrees will be correct. The degrees will, will almost all be correct, what you would expect. For most choices. For most choices. So for almost all choices of vertices in X1, you'll have the property that it'll have the right degree to the other parts. And because the, if the degrees are linear, are, are, are linear, that is the densities are constants, then the subsets, which are the neighborhoods that you're looking at to try to continue the embedding, uh, will, be, will be large subsets and you get inheritance of regularity for uh, large subsets. And that's, that's one approach. Another approach is more of an analytic approach, which is by a telescoping sum argument. It's very nice and it appears in the work on graph limits. Um, so these are the two basic approaches to graph counting. And in combination, you can prove uh, many results, such as the, the graph removal lemma. It says that uh, for each epsilon greater than zero in graph H, there's a delta greater than zero such that every graph on n vertices with at most delta n to the h copies of h. That means that you have this graph g on n vertices and it has few copies of h. It could have up to n choose h, but it has very few. Uh, then it can be made h-free by removing just a small fraction of the edges, epsilon n squared edges. It was first proved for triangles by Ruja and Samrati in 1976, and it has many applications in various areas. For example, the simplest proof of Ross theorem, which is the, the three-term case of Samrati's theorem, follows uh, from the graph removal lemma, from the triangle removal lemma, in fact. And here's, here's the proof idea. So you, you have this graph G, this big graph, and you first apply Samrati's regularity lemma. And then you clean up the graph. You delete the edges between pairs which are sparse, so which have low edge density, and between pairs which are irregular. And you've, you haven't deleted many edges. So you've deleted some small number of edges. And if there's any remaining copy of H in the whole graph, then each edge goes between a pair which is both regular and dense. And from the graph counting lemma, you then get not, not only is there one copy, but there's at least delta n to the h copies. There's a, at least some constant times n to the h copies. Um, so that's the proof idea of the graph removal lemma. Notice that it, because it uses the regularity lemma, the dependence of delta on epsilon is one over a tower of twos of height polynomial and one over epsilon. So it's this huge bound. And it would be really nice to get better estimates uh, in fact, if you could get really good estimates, then you can improve bounds on Ross theorem in many of the applications. Unfortunately, we're far away from that. But this problem's been asked many times. And uh, in the first progress in this direction uh, was a result that proved that the tower height you can improve from polynomial in 1 over epsilon to logarithmic in 1 over epsilon. And so it, it makes some progress in the right direction. Uh, there's some interesting lemmas that come up in this, uh, but the big picture idea is you do a density increment argument. Instead of doing the mean square density that we saw earlier, it's a different density, mean entropy density, and you show that you can do uh, the proof using only a logarithmic number of iterations instead of polynomial. Now this is very far away from the lower bound, which is just slightly super polynomial in one over epsilon, uh, which follows from Barron's construction. Yeah, Tim? Uh, 
this is proved, um, it, it, it's more along the lines of the regularity proof, but it, it's, it's built into the proof of the graph removal lemma. So, so it's not a new proof of counting. You can, counting lemma is counting lemma. Once you have it, you have it in this context. So it's not, you're, you're not using, you're not developing a new counting lemma here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a, a strengthening of the graph removal lemma, the induced graph removal lemma, which says the exact same thing, except instead of copies of H as subgraphs, you're looking for induced copies of H. And now instead of deleting edges, you're allowed to add or delete edges. And you can try to prove it using the, the regularity method, combining summary's regularity lemma with the counting lemma. Uh, but you get really stuck with the irregular pairs. So what do you do with the edges between the irregular pairs? And this becomes a really uh, serious issue here, uh, but we can still prove uh, the induced graph removal lemma. And the way that they do this is they introduce, uh, to get around the, this issue of irregular pairs, they introduce the strong regularity lemma. And it is proved by repeatedly applying summary's <laughs> regularity lemma and it gives a Wowser type bound. So uh, it's next up in the Ackerman hierarchy. Um, so the Wowser function is just to iterate the tower function. Okay. And Noga alone asked to, to improve the bounds here, basically. Can you, in particular, can you improve the Wowser type bounds? Um, and one approach would be to give a new proof of the strong regularity lemma which improve the bounds from Wowser to something smaller. Uh, so let's look at that approach first. So first we have to say, what, what is the strong regularity lemma? Well, you're given an epsilon greater than zero and a function from the positive integers to the interval zero, one. And then there's gonna be some M such that the following holds. Every graph has a pair of equitable partitions, P and Q. Q is gonna be a refinement of P and each of them have at most m parts, satisfying p is epsilon regular. It's just like in Samurai's regularity lemma, but now q is much more regular. Its regularity depend, is this function that can depend on the number of parts of p, and the mean square density of p and q are close. And this, the last condition, the mean square density of p and q are close, um, is equivalent to saying that for almost all pairs of parts in Q, the edge density between them is roughly the same as the edge density between the pair of parts in P that they, they lie in. And this has become an essential tool in graph property testing. And as I said earlier, its proof is by repeated application of the re summary's regularity lemma and gives a Wowser type bound. Um, what we did was give a construction using the same construction from before, but changing the parameters around, which gives, uh, which shows that the upper bound is essentially tight. You get a Wowser in polynomial and one over epsilon lower bound for this. And it, the construction really shows that you have to use the iterated use of the regularity lemma, that you, you see it from the other direction in the construction uh, to prove the strong regularity lemma. So, the first attempt to, to improve the bound in the induced graph removal lemma was to improve the strong regularity lemma bound, but then we saw that this, this can't be done. Um, this Wowser type bound independently at the same time was done by Asaf Shapira and his student. Uh, they gave a little bit weaker dependence here, but again, the important thing that was, was Wowser was next up in the Ackerman hierarchy, so it's, it's of similar flavor. Okay, so that was the the first attempt to try to improve the induced graph removal lemma bound. But actually, you don't need the full strong regularity lemma. You need a key corollary. And what this corollary says, what? Can you relate the Bowser lemma to what you just saw in the talk before? Can, sorry, what? Just, just in the talk before, we saw sort of kind of Bowser lemma into where you have these two different graphs, one was in the spectrum, and one was in the spectrum. I don't, I don't understand the question. So Lex, Lex's last right, theorem, right. Lex Schreiber's last theorem said you could approximate a big matrix if it's the mainest one that's bounded by one by a small matrix which is close to a low rank matrix. 
Mm -hmm. And Christian had asked how effective that is, and now he's asking if you can cause trouble for less. Uh, it's a good question. I'll think about it more. We can talk later after the talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, for Percy. OK, so for the induced graph removal lemma, you only need this key corollary that for every epsilon greater than 0, there's a delta greater than 0, um, such that every graph has an equitable partition into a small number of parts. And each of the parts has a vertex subset, which is a big chunk of the, which is a lot of the vertices of the whole graph. That's a big chunk. And now every pair is epsilon regular, ui, uj. So if you pass to these subsets of your parts, you can get them to be every pair epsilon regular. So this is the way around the fact that they're irregular pairs in the regularity lemma. You can pass the subsets. And it further has the property that the density between each between almost all pairs ui, uj, and the vivj is at most epsilon. So most of the pairs, the density between the small subsets is the same as between the, the larger subsets that they're contained in. And, um, and in this corollary, there's a, a new proof that only has a tower type bound. And so it gives a tower type bound for the induced graph removal lemma. So you can bring down the Wowser to tower. And the proof is uh, by strengthening uh, earlier weak regularity lemmas of Samaretti and Duke, Lefman, and Rodel. Just as you, you iterate Samaretti's regularity lemma to get the strong regularity lemma, there are these weak regularity lemmas which have only exponential type dependencies. And if you iterate those, you get a tower type dependence, and you can use those to get uh, an improved bound on the induced graph removal lemma. Okay. So I've been talking about the usual regularity lemma and the strong regularity lemma, which have these enormous bounds. Uh, what's also quite useful is to have regularity lemmas which have more effective bounds. And the freeze canon weak regularity lemma has only an exponential type bound, but gives you a, a weaker conclusion. So it gives you a partition, an equitable partition, just as before. And it has a more global property, that if you take any two subsets, S and T, of your, of your graph, if the number of edges between S and T is roughly what you would expect based on how S intersects the various parts and how T intersects the various parts and the density between the parts. This is what you'd expect. And, uh, and for any pair of subsets of your whole graph, you get that the number of edges is close to what you expect, at most epsilon times V squared. And it has, uh, so the key thing is that the number of parts H is only single exponential type. And it's become a fundamental algorithmic tool. Uh, you can use it to get approximation al algorithms for many problems of interest, for example, for max cut. And uh, for quantitative estimates, the proof gives a, an exponential and 1 over epsilon squared upper bound. And Lovas and Segedi gave a lower bound, which is exponential in 1 over epsilon. Uh, and if you could improve the upper bound and do so algorithmically, you'd get improved uh, algorithms, approximation algorithms for, for many problems, including max cut. So it's a, a basic question. Um, unfortunately, again, just as before, you get the feeling when you do the proof that the upper bound's correct, and you can reverse engineer the construction using randomness wherever you can, basically, and you get a lower bound construction which matches the upper bound. <laughs> it's, it's like eight pages, so um, with a number of lemmas. But, but um, at, lunch. at lunch, I can I'll to tell you more. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, OK. So there's actually a, a general way of that we, we view these regularity lemmas now. Well, there's a graph limit approach, which is just saying that all of these follow from compactness of some certain space. But there's another approach that's the modern view of looking at it, is you can prove the usual regularity lemma by iterating 
the freeze cannon weak regularity lemma. And the strong regularity lemma you get by iterating the usual regularity lemma. And each time you go one up in terms of the number of parts in, 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 the, in the Ackerman hierarchy. And so you start to see uh, this various things. And it's not really clear if you know, iterating it further actually gives you more power or not, <laughs> if, if it's useful for anything. OK. Uh, Unfortunately not. I think everybody's tried this, uh, who, who spent some time with these things. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the answer appears to be no, that it's too weak. So you'd love to use the, this to prove the graph removal lemma, but it, it doesn't hold. What does hold is that there's a counting lemma. So once you have applied the, right, the, the, the weak regularity lemma, there's a, a corresponding counting lemma. And um, it allows you to approximate the number of, say, triangles or K4s or any graph you're looking for within here. But still, it's not enough. So you have counting lemma, you have some type of regularity lemma, and you try to do the proof, and you realize it falls apart. It's because this is somehow too global. <laughs> and the regularity lemma allows you to do things between pairs of parts, whereas this one's much more global, talks about huge subsets. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is uh, I've talk, told you about some various regularity lemmas. Um, the reg graph regularity lemma is only really useful for studying dense graphs, the sum raised regularity lemma. And it's because the quantitative estimates are just uh, huge. So you'd like to, to understand what's going on in sparse graphs. And I, we've heard a, a good deal about and we'll hear a lot more about some of the exciting developments in bounded degree. But here you'd like to look at things like counting lemmas that follow from a general uh, global regularity lemma. And so again, you want to get below the dense case where there's edge density is, is a constant. Uh, so Kohayakawa and Rodel in the 90s independently developed the regularity lemma for sparse graphs. And they, and it was part of a general program toward extending results that we know hold for dense graphs down to sparse graphs. And the main open problem was to prove a counting lemma in sparse graphs, which complements the regularity lemma. Now, for, for dense graphs, the counting lemma was the easy thing, comparatively. Here, um, the proof is very similar. You have to figure out what the right things to prove are, but once you have everything together, it's in the same spirit as the original proof. Here, though, once you try to do things like inheriting regularity, if you have a vertex if in, a, in a sparse graph, its neighborhoods will typically be so small that you won't inherit regularity. And so it becomes a serious issue. Um, the first breakthrough in this area was a paper by Kohayakawa, Rodel, Schacht, and Skoken. Um, they were able to count triangles. It's, 45 pages, uh, and um, what the main thing here is going to be is a general counting lemma. So we can count any graph, and there's a lot of applications. Now we can do sparse extensions of many of the classical results in dense graphs down to sparse graphs. Um, now, you c there's a caveat here. You can't prove a general counting lemma that complements the Kohayakawa riddle regularity lemma just because if you have it too general, it just won't be true, and there's counterexamples you can come up with. But in the right context, you can still prove this and still get many of the, the consequences you want to establish. And uh, what is the right area to look in is pseudo-random graphs. So a graph gamma is called P beta jumble. This is a notion introduced by Thomas, and it's a very basic notion of pseudo-randomness. Um, and it becomes, it's very natural from spec, for spectral reasons. Uh, so a graph is P beta jumbled if for all vertex subsets X and Y, the number of edges between X and Y differs from P times X times Y, so it differs from having edge density P by at most beta times the square root of the size of X times the size of Y. And some basic examples are uh, take the random graph where, where with every edge with probability P. 
That's P beta jumbled with beta being uh, big O of square root of NP with high probability. And uh, the famous expander mixing lemma tells you that every ND lambda graph, that's a graph on n vertices, it's deregular, and second largest eigenvalue lambda is d over n lambda jumbled. So there's many examples. There's a whole survey on pseudo-random graphs by Krivilevich and Sudakov. There's many constructive and randomized examples of p beta jumbled graphs that we know of. And uh, so before I go into stating the regularity lemma and counting lemma, I just want to give you a couple sample applications of it. So the first one is a sparse graph removal lemma. It's an extension of the graph removal lemma down to a sparse version. But, and you need to, to have some condition on your graph for it to be possible that such a result will hold. Um, so it says for every graph H uh, and every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero and C greater than zero, such that if you have a, a sufficiently jumbled graph, so sufficiently jumbled, this is the two de degeneracy of the graph. It's closely related to the degeneracy of the graph. So you have this graph gamma, which is sufficiently jumbled. Then any subgraph of gamma containing few copies of H. So in gamma, you'll have about P to the E of H times N to the V of H copies of H. Just by counting in gamma, you'll have about that many. And if you have a subgraph which contains few copies of H, then that subgraph can be made H-free by removing few edges. The number of edges in gamma is Pn squared over 2 about. So, um, and so, uh, so this is a, a sparse graph removal lemma. It's, it's, it's talking about sparse graphs, which are subgraphs of pseudo-random graphs. And this is the general context that we'll, we'll be in. And it was first proved by, for triangles by Kahayokawa, Rodel, Schacht, and Skokin. Uh, Yes. Does anything about bounded degree graphs? No, it doesn't. So this jumbled, the jumbledness is, this is usually about n to the 2 minus epsilon, where epsilon is some fixed thing. So if h is fixed, then you'll have some epsilon that's fixed. It's really about graphs in that range. But it, 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 it depends on the jumbledness. But optimal jumbledness will be uh, beta being square root of pn. And uh, like the random graph has optimal jumbledness. And in that range, you'll see that you'll get n to the 2 minus epsilon. Uh, for cycles, you can get it down to uh, n to the 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon's fixed, for long, where the epsilon depends on the length of the cycle. And that has some interesting applications. Um, so that was the first application. There was many other applications along those lines. Uh, so we, the first application was graph removal lemma, but there's many classical results like Ramsey's theorem and the erdos shimonovich uh, erdos stone shimonovitz theorem that you can prove uh, sparse versions using the counting lemma. So this is taking the regularity method that's already developed in dense graphs and bringing it down to the sparse world. Uh, here's a, a less obvious application, um, induced Ramsey numbers. Uh, so the early results in Ramsey theory came out around the 1930s, but it really started becoming a theory with many beautiful and deep results in the early 1970s. And one of them was the induced Ramsey theorem, uh, which tells you that for every H and R, there's a graph G such that every R edge coloring of G contains an induced copy of H whose edges are the monochromatic, all the same color. So for every H and R, there's this bigger graph of G. Whenever you R edge color G, it contains somewhere an induced copy of H that's monochromatic. And the induced Ramsey number is the minimum size of such a graph N, uh, such a graph G. And this was independently proved by Doiber, Erdish, Heinel, Poza, and Rodel that these numbers exist. This is the induced Ramsey theorem. And the early proofs of this theorem gave really huge upper bounds on these induced Ramsey numbers. Some of them Ackerman type, some of them tower type, but really big bounds. Uh, but it's conjectured, there's a, a couple of conjectures that say that really the, the bound should be much more uh, down to earth. So uh, there's a, a conjecture of Trotter that for bounded degree graphs, their induced Ramsey number should be at most polynomial in the number of vertices. 
And he only looks at the, he only conjectures for the two color case, but of course it should also hold for more colors. Um, so for bounded degree graphs, they should have only, their, their induced Ramsey number should be at most polynomial. And this was proved originally by Wuchek and Rodel, which gave, uh, it's a, a regularity type argument. It doesn't actually use the regularity lemma, but it's in the same spirit, and it's a, the graph G that he, they construct is this uh, strange ran, randomized construction. Um, but they pro were able to prove it, and they gave uh, a tower type upper bound on C of delta. So a tower of twos of height, polynomial, and delta. Um, later, with Benny Sudikov, we, we were able to prove uh, a much more reasonable bound, that it's at most delta times log delta, this, this C of delta. And both of these proofs only really work for two colors. So you'd like to extend it to, to more colors. And using the, the, sparse regu the, the, the sparse regularity method, we've improved it so that the exponent is now delta, and it works for any number of colors. Um, and there's also a strengthening that holds. So in one of the colors, you'll actually find induced copies of every graph on k vertices with maximum degree delta. And for that, you really, this delta will be sharp. So uh, just from a counting argument. Um, so how do you prove this? You take your graph G to be, uh, you can take any pseudo-random graph with appropriate parameters, it's big enough, so it's gonna be of this size. Now you, you, you R edge color, you have this R edge coloring of G and you apply the, the sparse regularity lemma and, uh, uh, and then you use counting. So one of the color classes will have density at least one over R, relative density at least one over R within many parts. Okay, so what is the regularity lemma for sparse graph? It's really very close to the original regularity lemma. But You're, you, yes? So what you just said it follows, a, you can also prove a density uh, version of, uh, of this, that if you, instead of coloring in R colors, you have a subgraph with sufficient density? No, 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 so you have to apply Ramsey's theorem in the proof too, to the reduced graph. So you have lots of parts with density at least one over R, and then you have an R edge coloring of the reduced graph where each pair you give so, density. No, but it's just a question of whether you can use good edge type results. As well as, as, as Ramsey type results. There are, you can prove Turan type results as well. But certain theorems are just not true that if you have some constant edge density, you don't have triangles in a graph, for example, right? So certain things you have to get below, above a threshold. Um, Is, is that clarify the question? Okay. So what is the regularity lemma for sparse graphs? The re notion of regularity lemma is, that, is exactly the same, except before we had that the density, density between a pair of parts, uh, the subsets between the pair is at most epsilon. And now we're gonna have much stronger, the density is gonna be much stronger concentrated. It's gonna be concentrated with the edge density of the graph G involved too. So this is the correct notion if you wanna make it non-trivial for sparse graphs. For sparse graphs, they'll always be regular because there's just few edges there and everything is roughly the same density. But you, you put the edge density of the graph in. And I'm gonna state the regular, regularity lemma in the, the new version of Scott, the sparse regularity lemma. So the original version of Kohayokawa and Rodel, they added an additional assumption which is helpful for the proof that between any two large subsets, the edge density doesn't go up too much. It's never, there's no dense spots in the graph, really, large spots. And Scott found a way around it, um, and you get exactly the same regularity lemma as you have in dense graphs. The way around it, so his proof, instead of using the mean square density, he uses a different function than just the usual parabola. He takes the parabola, and then he makes it linear after some point. So for first range, it's, it's quadratic and then linear, and if you're very careful, you'll be able to get the sparse version. And the reason that they were able to do this is, in the version of Kohayakawa and Rudel, you don't allow for any dense spots, and here, once you see dense spots, you just declare them irregular, and there can't be too many of them, in a sense. Um, so, uh, 
So it, it turns out that this has some, a, a few new applications, but generally, Kohayo Kawa and Rodel's version is sufficient for whatever applications you're typically looking for. Ah, ah, so I call this a, an epsilon regular partition, which means that all but at most an epsilon fraction of the pairs are epsilon regular. And I haven't defined it for you before, but that's a good question. Yeah. So, so, so there are, you allow an epsilon fraction of the pairs to be irregular. Exactly. Right. And, and this is why the, there's lots of difficulties in, in, in developing the sparse regularity method is because if you do it in the most general context, it just won't be true. You can come up with lots of counterexamples. But uh, under the right assumptions, you can, you can prove a sparse counting lemma. Very careful that most of the edges are hidden in this abstraction. Exactly. And so you can't see anything. And, that, and that, that's why it's helpful to have this assumption that Kahayo Kawa and Rodel had. But it turns out it's not necessary is the so point. That's right. So that, that's, what, that's what can happen. And so it, it turns out that it, it typically is the case that, that this version and the original version of Kohayo Kawa and Rudel are roughly the same usefulness. <laughs> this is a, a cleaner statement. And, um, uh, and there just, I've heard of a couple new applications where you, you, you don't have to verify that large parts don't, aren't dense in these new applications. So it, 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 this can be helpful. Um, so there's no condition on P in the, in the regularity there? There's no condition on P, yes. It's a very simple, it's a very simple statement. The P goes in here. The, the point is that you can essentially hide the <laughs> really dense parts between irregular pairs. So the K is really only depends on epsilon, not on P? Exactly. It's the, it's the usual bound, essentially. It's just using a slightly different function. And it's essentially the same proof, but with this different function. You're just careful throughout the whole thing. OK. So that's the regularity lemma for sparse graphs. So again, it was originally developed by Kohayakawa and Rodel, and there's this new version. This is the statement of the new version. Um, and I want to just give you a flavor for what's going on in the proof of the counting lemma. So I told you actually about two different papers. Before I started talking about sparse regularity lemma, that was a paper that David Conlon and I worked on, which was uh, a little over 60 pages. This one's 70 pages for, for, the, for general graph counting, and it has, it has lots of applications. Um, but I want to give you the flavor. It's not that difficult. It's actually, uh, there's just a few simple lemmas. And, and then it's proof by picture after you have those lemmas. And so I want to show you the proof by picture part. Um, so the general setup is that we have this graph gamma, which is, we'll do it in the case of triangles, but the, the whole technique carries through for more general graphs. So we have this tripartite graph gamma, which is jumbled. So each pair is jumbled with a certain density and vertex sets x, y, and z. And then we have a subgraph g of gamma. So it's relatively dense subgraph of gamma. And it's epsilon regular between the parts, between each of the pairs. This is, the, <laughs> this is the sparse counting lemma. Okay. And this is the setup I'm telling you what you're trying to prove. And uh, this is the statement. This is the rough statement of, of the sparse counting lemma. So what you want to show is that you have this, host, this big graph gamma. And then you have this subgraph of gamma. And gamma is sufficiently jumbled. You don't know anything about g except that it's epsilon regular between the parts. You know that gamma is, is jumbled between the parts. And the, the triangle counting lemma so tells you that the number of triangles in G is approximately what you expect based on the edge density between the pairs and the sizes of the various subsets. So that's, that's the setup. Um, and then here's the proof. So, uh, well, this is the proof idea. And I, I, there's some, some important lemmas which I'll tell you about which I, without going into detail. But he, here this picture is I'm trying to count copies of G in, with one vertex in X, one vertex in Y, and one vertex in Z. And this, 
denotes that I'm trying to embed this triangle with edges in G. Now, there's a, a one of the key, two key lemmas is about doubling, which is applying a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And you can double a vertex. And what it tells you is that if you could count these two graphs, in general, for every graph, you'll get four graphs. But if you can count those four graphs, then you can count the one above. So that's what the doubling procedure. And it's a, just an application of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. It takes a page to do. And uh, now this looks like a bigger graph. It contains a triangle in it. But here, you don't need, uh, you're only counting copies now where this, the straight edges should be in G and the squiggly edges should be in gamma. So if you can count these things, then you can count this one. So this is the, this is the doubling procedure. And then, because of the jumbleness, you can essentially fix these vertices. And because it's sufficiently jumbled, you can count it if you can just count it without the jumbled edge. So now, what these pictures are telling us is that if we can count C4s, then we can count triangles. OK, so we're trying to count C4s. Now, the first technique was this doubling. There's a second technique called densification, uh, where if we have a vertex of degree 2 and its neighbors are not adjacent, you can replace that vertex by a, a dense edge here. Basically, instead of counting these C4s, you're going to be counting for each pair going across how many vertices in here they're both adjacent to. And then you show it's, it's going to be regular, it'll follow, and dense. So you have this auxiliary counting. So if you can count this picture, then you can count this picture. And this is some auxiliary graph going between, which is dense and regular. So we started off with a triangle, and we got back to a triangle. But now we're in a little bit better situation, because one of the things we're trying to count is dense. And then again, we apply doubling, where we repeat we double this vertex using Cauchy-Schwartz. And then we delete the jumbled edges, because we can count without those. If we can count these, we can count these. And then again, we can now do densification on this vertex. And we get down to a dense triangle. So we know how to count dense triangles, because uh, triangle in the dense case, because we have the counting lemma. And so this is a transference principle. This transfers this proof from uh, the sparse world down to the dense world. Um, OK, so <laughs> this is a summary of a, of a longer proof. But uh, it shows you how you can count by counting using some things, you can count other things using it. And uh, I'll finish by mentioning that there's a lot more applications of this. So you can extend the erdogan simonovitz theorem. There's a sparse version of that. There's sparse versions of Ramsey's theorem. I mentioned the graph removal lemma. There's uh, sparse versions of the removal lemma for groups and Ross theorem uh, that come from this. Uh, there's this whole development by Chung, Graham, and Wilson on quasi-random graphs. And this, was a, this is a big area where you show that many properties that random graphs have are all turn out to all be equivalent. For example, uh, being epsilon regular and, uh, well, and having the correct count of C4s or any, or also the correct count of any fixed subgraph, uh, these are all equivalent. And it turns out in this world, where you're looking at subgraphs of pseudo random graphs, that the equivalence uh, carries over. So all these equivalences actually carry over because you can transfer from the dense world down to the sparse world. And you can prove also induced subgraphs result, results, such as the induced Ramsey number, improved bounds for induced Ramsey numbers. You can also get uh, algorithmic applications. So there's many algorithmic uh, applications of Samurai's regularity lemma and its variance. And they have these added error terms, which, dis which are too big if you're looking for spar uh, in sparse graphs. So they just make the problem trivial. But in here, you get small error terms. And there's many multiplicity results, such as uh, Sidorenko's or, or conjectures, like Sidorenko's conjectures, which transfer uh, to the sparse world. And I think there should be more applications now that we have 
some sparse uh, counting. Um, there's also been a, there's a few open problems that I should, <laughs> I should mention. The, the degree of quasi rand of jumbledness that are necessary, uh, here I put this parameter here, this should be tied up to an additive constant. It would be nice to, to, to really pinpoint what the right constant that you should add is here. Um, the problem is we don't even have constructions which show that this is indeed, this will indeed be tight, but there's good reasons to believe this. Uh, so one problem is to, to come up with tight uh, bounds here. Another problem would be to extend some of these results to hypergraphs. Um, and this is closely, this has close parallels with what's going on in number theory. So the proof of uh, the green tau theorem that there's arbit arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions in the primes the way that proof goes is that it shows that Samaretti's theorem, that then subsets of intervals have long arithmetic progressions. You can transfer Samaretti's theorem down to dense subsets of pseudo-random sets with, using the appropriate notion of pseudo-randomness. And then they show that the primes form a dense subset of some larger, almost primes, which are, are pseudo-random. Uh, and so, uh, it would be nice to extend these results to hypergraphs and possibly get a new proof of, of the Green Tau theorem. Uh, there are many other <laughs> great problems here. Um, one of the, the biggest questions that I'm interested in that we touched on earlier is to get better bounds for the graph removal lemma and the various other applications of the regularity lemma. In general, the, the new direction that's, that's happened in, in the last some years is to try to remove the regularity lemma completely. So we have a huge number of applications of the regularity lemma, and you can prove that something holds, but it gives terrible uh, quantitative estimates, and it would be nice to get new proofs of the various uh, uh, results without using the regularity lemma, which tells you more about the problem. Um, so anyways, uh, that's it. Thank you.